Welcome to Caps Drive this week. Uh, Will Woodall, Mike Rary. Hey, Mike. Hey, Will. Uh, we're going to take a look at the start of August, and uh, markets have sort of turned negative, and we'll talk about that. Uh, we're also going to give an update on the framework, and then um, talk about the, the non-farm payrolls report and a lot of the payroll data that um, we've been digging into um, to sort of understand what's really happening under the surface that we're not seeing or hearing about in the headlines, but is actually, actually unfolding in the labor market. So yep. let's start off with the equity returns. Yep. And there you see the red on the board month to date. Um, so equities having a tough, roughly a week period here. Growth stocks generally underperforming value stocks. Uh, large value stocks actually hanging in there pretty well. And now we're at the point where quarter to date, so since July 1st, value stocks definitely outperforming growth stocks. Um, so a bit of a uh, style shift, regime shift, and you know it seems like some of this sell-off was precipitated from rising longer-term interest rates, which would also make sense given that you know growth stocks are more sensitive to rising long-term interest rates than value stocks are, right. generally speaking. Yeah, still a long way to go to close the gap between growth and value yeah. year to date, but um, we're seeing progress there. All right, let's move on to fixed income because. Uh, Focusing specifically in the long bond. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is where the more dramatic price action was. You know, we talked about it a little bit last week. A lot of this really comes from outside of the U.S., from Japan. Um, you know, the Bank of Japan sort of flubbing the communication on yield curve control and upping the cap on where they'll allow the 10-year Japanese government bond yield to trade. Mm -hmm. You know, now it can go as high as 1%, which doesn't seem like a lot. Um, but this is part of a big carry trade, and it's very fragile. And once again, it may not seem like a lot, but that's equivalent to a surprise 50 basis point rate hike in Japan, what essentially happened. Yeah, and explain the carry trade so yeah. people have so context. Probably the simplest way to think about it is if you're a, a Japanese investor, um, or really any investor globally, uh, you basically have an option where you could buy a Japanese government bond, a 10-year bond currently yielding, you know, something in the neighborhood of half a percent to 1%, and that's your risk-free investment. Or you could go elsewhere in the world and buy, for example, a U.S. Treasury, where a 10-year is yielding you know, 4%. Um, and that seems like a no-brainer, but if you're in Japan and you buy that U.S. bond, you have to hedge out the currency risk, which costs you money. So, so you know, we're getting to the point where Japanese investors, which have a lot of money, are thinking, hey, do I keep owning these treasuries? Or, hey, are yields going up here in Japan to the point where Japanese yields are actually more attractive than buying a U.S. treasury and hedging out the currency risk? Right. And, you know, it's still more attractive to own treasuries and hedge out the currency risk. The, the concern is that this could just unwind and it was, you know, one-sided positioning. But, you know, the point is this is a self-defeating trade because... You know, what happened, all right, Japanese government bonds for a minute there looked more attractive than hedged U.S. treasuries, but then hedged U.S. treasury yields went up, and right. so now they're more attractive again. So yeah. it doesn't have a lot of room to run unless there's a big impetus for the Bank of Japan to really start a hiking cycle. And that doesn't seem like what's happening here, and, you know, the inflation data in Japan doesn't suggest that that's a, a good course of action either. Yeah. So... Thank you for that. Um, let's turn our attention to alts, and uh, energy continues to ramp. Yeah, and this is, um, you know, it started out as a bit of a trend in July. We started to see energy prices pick back up again, and now it's gotten to the point where you look at energy quarter to date up over 12%, and, you know, you look at gasoline prices in, in the U.S. now, you know, at levels that we haven't seen since last fall, and it's starting to become worrisome for the Fed as they start to, you know, as they continue to try to defeat inflation. And it's starting to show up in our inflation forecast, mm -hmm. you know, six to 12 months out. Um, so it may seem like progress, oh, the economy's doing well, but once again, that is a problem for the Fed. Yeah. Makes people have to buy gas, right? Mm -hmm. All right, let's uh, move to framework updates, starting with uh, liquidity. Mm -hmm. And 
liquidity here, high level looking at money supply, not a significant change. We continue to see, you know, not much of an increase in money supply growth year over year going out over the next 12 months. Yeah. Under the hood, as we look at net liquidity, it's a little bit more of a story. Yeah, so let's look at net liquidity. So focusing in a little bit more, just a reminder, net liquidity, what you do is you take Fed assets and then you subtract out the Treasury general account and reverse repo, which are you know, liquidity, but not necessarily liquidity that is out in the economy that can grow the economy or buy asset prices. So that's why you subtract out those other two components. And this has provided a great short lead, short-term lead on U.S. equity prices. Obviously, the S&P 500 here shown in blue has detached from our net liquidity indicator for reasons we've talked about previously. Um, but we're at a point now, once again, where the Treasury has stated they're going to increase the size of the TGA. They're going to continue to build up their cash buffers again since they were drawn down before the debt limit was, was finally increased. And, you know, that's going to put downward pressure on this green line. Thankfully, it looks like, you know, how's the Treasury going to do that? They're going to issue a bunch of bills. They're going to issue new Treasury bills. Thankfully, it looks like money market funds are ready to absorb mm -hmm. a lot of that, which is what we're assuming. So really, this green line going down, this is what happens if uh, the Fed just keeps reducing the size of their balance sheet. Um, and so, then eventually, the S&P has to catch down. Yeah. Or, you know, the Fed reverses course, or they have to solve another banking crisis by making loans. That would move the green line up. But once again, the path of least resistance here is for the blue line to fall back down towards liquidity implied fair value. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. All right, let's move on to inflation. A um, bit of a change here in our headline. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so uh, we're getting the inflation numbers this week for the month of July. What do we expect to see there? Uh, continued disinflation from core CPI. So you see that light blue line continuing to come down on a year-over-year -year basis. A lot of that just driven by shelter, amongst other things. But um, now we've talked about this previously. Headline inflation, the dark blue line, which includes food and energy prices, the easy part is over. Now we're at the point where you have the only thing that's sort of left is the stubborn inflation, inflationary components in there. And now that we've seen this little rebound in commodity prices, food and energy prices, if, if anything, that's going to put some upward pressure on our forecast for headline inflation going forward. So this is basically setting up for another contentious, dramatic Jackson Hole symposium and, you know, September Fed meeting if, if our dark blue line sort of plays out. Yeah. And, and what's the Fed's feelings about headline? Mm -hmm. Well, they've said, you know, they, they trust core measures, super core you know, trimmed mean type measures that strip out the volatility more, but they're also cognizant of the fact that consumers place their, judge their inflation expectations based on headline because the price that everybody monitors the closest are food and energy. Mm -hmm. um, so they are very cognizant of it, especially when they talk about, you know, we want to make sure inflation expectations don't run away because that type of inflation expectations, those rising in consumers' minds, that's what makes inflation sticky. That goes into wages, that goes into the economy, then you get a wage price spiral. So they're cognizant of it, even though they might not talk about it as much as they should. All right. And um, let's move on to a look at non-farm payrolls and some interesting data we've culled here. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so last week, payrolls report, non-farm payrolls report um, for for the month of July. And, you know, what we're looking at, the first thing you see is clearly the trend here is slowing in terms of month over month change in non-farm payrolls, 187,000 jobs added last month. That's obviously, there's been volatility, but that's obviously coming down. Yeah. So, and you would expect that, right? Um, the second thing we're seeing, it's very important when you're looking at mo momentum of the labor market to watch the revisions. So there are three revisions to each non-farm payrolls report and then a longer revision cycle. And so that light blue line, it shows the revision in each month. And we have now six consecutive months of downward revisions. 
And so that tends to happen around economic turning points, especially when you see bankruptcies start to climb. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those businesses are pinged for their payroll data and they don't respond. So then they get estimated. Then we later find out they went out of business and then the number gets revised down, right? Um, so that, that momentum is there as well. Um, the other thing you're seeing, you know, you look at this number and it seems pretty soft landing-esque, right? We're slowing the pace of job growth. Most folks would say that it's easier to find people to hire now than it was a year ago. You know, layoffs are picking up. There is churn within the labor market. We're also seeing temp workers getting laid off. Mm -hmm. You know, folks held on to those temp workers for an extended period of time just in case. And now they, you know, their expectations for their businesses have changed or they feel more confident going out and getting full-time workers. They've let those temp workers go. Um, so we're seeing that. Um, you know, the other thing we're seeing is the average work week is getting cut, which suggests, hey, we know we don't want to let people go, but we know demand in our business is slowing. Right. So we need to start cutting hours. So all that speaks to softening. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with that, year over year average hourly earnings are up 4.4%. So that's potentially the problem, right? If it were a true soft landing, you know, the Fed needs to get that average hourly earnings number probably in the low threes in order to feel confident that they're on a path to 2% sustained 2%, inflation. Yeah. So they're going to need to see that come down more. And there isn't a lot of margin for safety here. Yeah. I mean, if, if they try to soften the labor market more in the hopes of getting that wage growth down, there just isn't a big margin for safety. Yeah. We're too close to something like a negative payroll print, right? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So let's uh, let's talk about the next slide, which is uh, looks at jobless claims, seasonally adjusted. Yeah. Maybe explain what that means so people understand why we've sort mm -hmm. of backed out that from the COVID era. Yeah. Yeah, all, all these figures are seasonally adjusted for good reason, right? January is always the craziest number to look at because you get any measure of the labor market and it'll come out and say, oh, so this many jobs were added during the month. But in reality, January is the biggest seasonal adjustment. Mm -hmm. People are always laid off in January, always, um, because you hire up for the holiday season and then you lay off in January. So the seasonal adjustments smooth that out so it doesn't look so dramatic. So they're important. You should seasonally adjust your data, right? But what's happened, particularly when you look at jobless claims data, um, and these are continuing claims, COVID had such a one-time outsized impact on the jobless claims data around spring and summer 2020, like, you know, magnitude of 100x, mm -hmm. just off the charts, that it's heavily impacting the seasonal adjustment. And even in our view, potentially, you know, shifting the narrative in a way that Distorting is, is yes. a bit distorted, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So that's what we're trying to show here. So the dark blue line or the dark blue bars, that's the four week moving average of continuing jobless claims. And you see they peaked around, you know, week 15. So call that sometime in April. And they've been coming down. And so anybody who's sort of in the soft landing camp would look at that and say, hey, I know the labor market is slowing, it's weakening, it's softening, but clearly people aren't having a problem finding a job. And so this is not an issue, mm -hmm. right? And that's definitely been a feather in the cap of those in the soft landing camp. But if you look at the light blue bars, what we've done here is we say, we're still gonna seasonally adjust the data, but instead of using data from 1967 through now for the seasonal adjustment factors, use 1967 through 2020. Take out, Take out the outsized impact of COVID. And you see a totally different trend that actually makes a lot more sense with the other softening that we're seeing in the labor market. This shows that, you know, continuing claims are, you know, rising or hopefully topping off here. But it's definitely more consistent with the slowdown in non-farm payroll growth um, and the pickup in initial claims and things like that. So it's just COVID. We know COVID has distorted so much in our lives. But this is where, you know, Anybody who's just taking the data at face value. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's important to look beneath it, right? Yep. So yeah, we'll go back um, to economic growth. You know, it's all sort of the same thing. And you may have heard some pounding. People are doing construction in the building. So, you know, that's part of the slide, I guess you would say. But, um, you know, the trends is still 
relatively intact in terms of low and falling. Um, what's really interesting is we're starting to get some of the real-time or now cast figures for Q3 GDP, and they're just all over the place. They're just wild. You know, we've seen the consensus looking at almost no growth in Q3, but some now cast figures are near 4%. Yeah. And, you know, either one of those is a problem. The hope for the Fed is it's somewhere in between, right? Right. Because if we get 4% growth in Q3, um, inflation's not going to come down. No. And wage pressures are not going to come down. And then, unfortunately, what we'd have to, I mean, everybody's talking about hard landing, soft landing. You'd be sort of in a no landing scenario. And maybe the Fed would even have to go through another wave of hikes. And assets are not priced for that. Um, particularly growth stocks are not priced for another wave of rate hikes or another pickup in inflation from here. That would be really difficult for a lot of investors based on how they're positioned. It'd be great if you're at the short end of the yield curve. Yeah. You'd say, right. just give me more free yield, just risk free yield. But um, so that's what we're watching very closely. I mean, we'll be updating everybody on that going forward. But aside from that, you look at excess savings depleted, you know, softening in the labor market, um, you know, inventories, things like that. It, we should be slowing into the back half of the yeah, year. Yeah, signs point that we should be slowing, just a matter of when, right? Mm -hmm. like, does it happen in Q3? Does it happen in Q4? Same with sort of if we move on to the recession signal. Yep. Like it's the recession that never actually gets here, but yep. it'll get yep. here at some point. I mean, that's a sure bet. I, I guarantee you we'll have a recession sometime in the next 10 years, right? <laughs> you know, but it's, it's obviously that's not very useful information. It's all about when it happens. And if you look at our four signals, you know, what have been the developments, the yield curve signal is still active. We're still seeing longer term yield spreads inverted and near term spreads inverted, even though, you know, rate cuts are pretty much priced out over the next 12 months. Mm -hmm. um, you're still seeing an inversion in near term spreads, which is sort of the kiss of death, uh, if you will, for the economy. And then as you move out, we've actually seen a bit of uh, further recovery in the real economy. And this is volatile, but the latest one to sort of deactivate was the new orders to inventory ratio. The ISM data, you know, we saw that balance out to somewhere around one, which is, is good because what's happened is with uh, economic growth in the first half of the year being better than expected and consumers spending down their excess savings, retailers uh, have been able to shed all that excess inventory, which is nice. Yeah. Um, and it's more balanced now. So the labor market signal, we're still watching very closely. It's right on the cusp being active. of being active. And we know the seasonal adjustments right now are kind of wacky. So we're looking into all that. Um, and then markets are not stressed about it, even though perhaps they should be more stressed than they are. Well, maybe just comment on, since we are sitting here, um, on the downgrades on, I think, seven or eight banks. Mm -hmm. Just comment on yeah. what's happening in the banking sector and why it's important. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, so, you know, we've talked quite a long time that we had the fireworks in March and April, and we're on to the slow burn phase. That all these banks, as long as the Fed funds rate is up over 5%, and their cost of funds is in the ones, and everybody knows they can take their money out of the bank and go get a risk-free 5%, why would I leave it at the bank earning next to nothing? That's gonna be a slow burn. You're gonna see deposits come out. Um, you're gonna, it's gonna put pressure on profitability, all these types of things. And Moody's, in our view, is just late to the party. I mean, they're just putting their stamp on that and saying, hey, this is a problem. Right. The unfortunate part is a lot of these banks that just got downgraded they need cheap funding, mm -hmm. and you just on the margin made one source of funding for them, which would be private market debt, more expensive. So that's unfortunate. Um, I don't know, the market reacted to it. It's In our view, it doesn't really change the outlook. Right. Perhaps folks were thinking the outlook had improved and this had all gone away, but the fundamentals of the situation are still in place. I mean, you know, it would make sense that there would be something like this. Something like this would happen. And there's probably five or six other banks that are under review. Mm -hmm. um, what's the difference between under review and yeah. being downgraded? Yeah. Well, I don't know. A couple months. 
I mean, <laughs> just a matter I mean, of time. Yeah, I mean, as long as those fundamentals stay in place. I mean, you look at like BNY Mellon or State Street, which yeah. were under review, and those are big banks. Mm -hmm. But I mean, they're seeing the same thing. They had cash in their bank, and people are moving it into, thankfully, their own money market funds in a lot of instances. Right. But what changes that? Well, you need the money market yields to be more competitive with cash yields, and that's not going to happen if the Fed doesn't cut. So what's the difference? It's like two months. Yeah. You know, especially if the Fed hikes again, it just gets worse. Yeah. So. Can, and if it stays that way for a long period of time, yes. it continues to burn slowly. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, well, that's it for the week. Um, good update. If you have any questions, reach out to us uh, directly or someone in the private wealth team. Thanks for joining. We'll see you next week.